Afternoon, welcome to Policy Exchange. My name is Dean Godson, Director of Policy Exchange, and we're delighted to be able to welcome back uh, Claire Coutinho here to Policy Exchange to address the subject of free speech and leaders of tomorrow. As uh, many of you will know, this is her first major speech on the subject since uh, she managed to secure royal assent for the uh, Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill in Parliament, a major success and also the appointment of uh, the new free speech director, Arif Ahmed. Neither Claire nor indeed the wider subject of free speech are strangers here to policy exchange. Claire, we're glad to say, is a former senior uh, fellow here where she played an important part in our deliberations on our Indo-Pacific uh, Commission chaired by former Canadian Prime Minister uh, Stephen Harper, which of course are now beginning, the, the outcome of which is beginning to bear fruits in successive iterations of the integrated review, Mem UK membership of the CT CPTPP, I always get it wrong, and of course uh, the Hiroshima Accords uh, recently forged out uh, in Japan. Several of the provisions of the uh, free speech bill also had their intellectual genesis here at Policy Exchange in two landmark papers on academic freedom in the UK in 2019 and then in 2020. On that note, I'd uh, like to say thank you to Claire, whom I think was absolutely <coughs> pivotal in retaining the statutory tort in the bill, which of course is an essential guarantor of free speech as recommended in our paper. And she continued to stick at that even when some colleagues of mine in the upper house would have uh, deleted those. Um, here at Policy Exchange, of course, we are strong believers in being a home of debate, literally <coughs> a place where policies are exchanged, and we believe in championing those good ideas, and I know there are different perspectives here in the room today, and of course, in that spirit, we look forward uh, to welcoming those comments, and of course, uh, in particularly in the Q&A afterwards, usual house rules here at Policy Exchange, no question too outrageous, you just have to state your name and organization first. So with that, Claire, thank you for coming here for this address. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dean, for that generous introduction. Uh, as a former senior fellow of Policy Exchange, I am delighted to be here to speak on a topic for which you've been such a strong champion in recent years. As you mentioned, it was your report on academic freedom in the UK that planted the seeds for our higher education freedom of speech bill. And I stand here three years after the bill was introduced with the act having received royal assent. At a time when many were closing their eyes to the problem and saying there was nothing to see, policy exchanges research shone a light on why we needed to act. The quest for truth has long provided us with the moral coordinates for social and scientific progress. <coughs> Where debate has been suppressed, it's only held us back. We now give thanks to the Galileos, the Darwins, the Keplers, the Newtons for pushing forward the frontiers of our knowledge. Our understanding of astronomy, mathematics, natural history or biology wouldn't be the same if those visionaries did not believe in freedom of speech and the pursuit of truth. And yet today, we see free speech under threat in the very places where the most controversial debates should be taking place, on campus. The Conservatives have long been the architects of the modern education system. From the Butler Education Act in 1944, which expanded access to schools, to the Baker reforms of the late 80s that established the national curriculum and recognised the importance of school autonomy. And we've seen the consequences of sustained conservative reform over the past decade which has seen English pupils rocket up the international league tables in English, maths and science and be declared the best in the West for reading. It's the Conservatives who've stood up time and time again against the kind of educational progressivism which promises much but never delivers higher standards for students. We must now ensure that university students are able to be exposed to the intellectually rigorous debates that they're promised in higher education. The very purpose of a university is to create independent thinkers who are equipped with the tools to think about the world critically. They're important training grounds for the business, political and cultural leaders of tomorrow. 
And this generation will need the skills of critical thought more than ever. The pace of change that we're facing is transforming the world at a speed not seen before. Take the onset of AI. The next generation of leaders will face even thornier questions than the ones we face today. What role should large language models like ChatGPT play in education? How do we integrate AI into the workforce without displacing human workers? And how do we navigate copyright disputes between human artists and AI? These are all challenging ethical and practical dilemmas with no obvious immediate answers. The next generation will have to approach these and so many other problems with an open mind, a desire to hear other opinions, not silence them. And we're doing students a disservice if we shelter them from other points of view and withhold the opportunity to develop their critical thinking. And we're setting them up for failure if we let them think that they can go through life shouting down people with different views. As J.S. Mill famously said, depriving ourselves of the chance to debate also denies us the clearer perception of truth produced by its collision with error. And yet vigilance is needed, as there are those who seek to stifle debate in our universities. Curious students are being deprived of attending events. Visiting speakers are intimidated by aggressive protests. And in the worst cases, academics are losing their livelihoods and their reputations for the crime of expressing an opinion. All of this is being driven by a small group of activists who shout the loudest. Activists who can fire off a lot of tweets and draft open letters, not simply to express their own opinion, but to close down a wider debate. And by now, we've seen the dangers of how that manifests itself on campus. If you're Tony Sewell, you'll have your honorary degree rescinded because the university doesn't like the conclusion of a report that you wrote for government. If you're Kathleen Stock, you'll be hounded out of your job by a toxic, organized campaign to get you fired. And we've even heard examples of research projects on the culture of censorship in universities being censored because they're deemed too dangerous. In other words, we may be at the stage where research into censorship is itself being censored. And it's spread to disciplines as far from politics as you can imagine, such as maths. I met with a group of mathematicians who were being pressured into decolonizing their maths curriculum by downplaying or magnifying the work of mathematicians depending on their race. They were deeply concerned when I spoke to them, but also fearful of speaking out because of the potential for a backlash that could put their jobs at risk. However, when I studied maths, I used an Indian decimal system, an Arabian-born algebra, and imaginary numbers forged in Europe. And at that meeting, I thought of the words of the 20th century mathematician David Hilbert, who said, mathematics knows no race or geographic boundaries. For mathematics, the cultural world is one country. And yet some people see even this discipline, the purest of all sciences, and one which has developed across borders for more than a millennium as an outlet for their activism, instead of being motivated by a love of their subject and the pursuit of truth. The experience of those mathematicians is one shared by many in academia. An insidious censorship bubbling away under the surface where students and academics with mainstream views don't say what they think because they are scared of the consequences for their studies or their careers. They're censored by activists who dress up their oppression in the language of tolerance and emotional safety. I sympathize with those who worry about the effects of toxic, hateful debates. I don't want to see freedom of speech used as an excuse to abuse. But a tolerant society isn't one where everyone must conform to a narrow ideological vision of moral virtue, where only those who take a certain point of view are allowed to speak their minds. A tolerant society is one which allows us to understand people we disagree with, and where minority and majority views are protected. It should be a university's duty to stay neutral, to facilitate debates, and to protect those who put minority views forward in good faith. Universities fail in that duty when they themselves take sides on these contested issues. They risk losing the trust of their staff and students when certain groups are made to feel that their views are not welcome. I have no doubt in my mind that there are many leaders at the top of universities who are personally committed to academic freedom. I've heard about this commitment firsthand. 
but vice chancellors and leadership boards must make sure that they're not being undermined by well-intentioned internal processes that stand in the way of freedom of speech. This pressure to conform to a progressive monoculture, both from activists and internal processes, has a material effect. Research shows that a third of all academics in the UK self-censor, a third. Often it's academics approaching the end of their careers who are more likely to feel that they can speak openly than their junior colleagues. But your right to free speech in academia shouldn't rely on your years of experience. It should be a right for all. And from Policy Exchange's own research, we know that this is not just an issue for those on the political right. While those on the right are more likely to self-censor, 42% of left-leaning academics in the social sciences report that they don't express their views due to a fear of backlash from their colleagues. And this will have wider effects than those faced by the individuals involved. For example, there's even evidence that shows that academic freedom boosts innovation. When academic freedom rises, the number of patents filed two years later grows. This creep of self-censorship matters. We don't bring an end to this culture of intimidation. We're allowing an intellectual sedative to be injected into the university experience, and that's why we chose to take action. We legislated as we promised in our 2019 manifesto to defend and promote that centuries-old principle, the principle of free speech, that has been at the center of so much of our progress as a nation. Our Freedom of Speech Act will hold universities accountable for the state of free speech on their campuses. It will protect staff, students, and visiting speakers who advocate viewpoints of all kinds. We've created a powerful new director of freedom of speech and academic freedom at the Office for Students. They'll be able to investigate and take action against providers who are found to have breached their duties to uphold free speech. Our new complaints mechanism, along with the introduction of the right to go to court, means that anyone who feels their free speech rights have been wrongly infringed will have a clear path to redress. And as Dean mentioned, we were resolute about making sure that academics and visiting speakers had the right to go to court. And for the first time, we're requiring student unions to protect free speech. Freedom of speech is not an optional extra at university. It is central to the university experience. Our measures are designed to give people studying and working in universities the confidence and security to speak their minds. At every stage of this process, they have been at the forefront of our thinking. And I can think of no one better to fight their corner than the new director of free speech and academic freedom, Professor Arif Ahmed. Arif is a professor of philosophy who's written passionately in the defense of free speech in the media. He stood firm in the face of attempts to shut down his own speaking events and campaigned to reform the free speech policy at his own university with an astounding result in his favor. He's defended views on the left and on the right, and I have no doubt that he will provide strong leadership in championing a culture of tolerance and open debate within our universities. As Arif has written himself, words are not a form of violence, they're an alternative to violence. Without that distinction, we are lost. Now this act by itself is not enough. I don't believe that any legislation by itself can change culture. However, it is already starting to have an effect. I've spoken to vice chancellors who are making plans to embed a culture of free speech at the beginning of a student's academic journey. The provost of University College London, Michael Spence, took the right approach when he <clears throat> made clear that a university is not a participant in the public debate, but a forum in which that debate takes place. We've already seen an emboldened approach for university leaders who are fighting back where council culture raises its head. I'm delighted that Kathleen Stock, despite the best attempts of some, did in fact speak to curious and respectful students at Oxford University recently, backed by strong action from their vice chancellor. I'm also pleased that students who disagreed were allowed to protest outside. Both are important. And that's because a healthy society is one where people who disagree can do so whilst living alongside each other. If you think about how we used to get to know each other, it was often in congregations, in churches, local community events, even that bastion of British culture, the pub, where the young, old, conservative liberal could all rub, rub alongside each other. But now, social media has made it easier than ever for us to become entrenched in our own tribes, surrounded by people who think just like us. It 
It's a vicious cycle. The more and more we use social media, the more its algorithms will feed us what we like to hear from who we like to hear it from. We get hooked on that drip of dopamine hits from people agreeing with us. Those who disagree with us become the enemy. But the fundamental well-being of our society rests on our ability to tolerate each other. On an individual level, our ability to connect to each other is what makes us happy and well. And when we think about the next generation, the leaders of tomorrow, what do we want for them? To teach them that they should shut down every person they encounter who has a different view, or teach them to be able to understand, to connect, to persuade, and to find common ground. But common ground only exists where discussion and debate are embraced. Free speech at university is an antidote to the toxic effects of social media. By instilling the next generation with a new appreciation for freedom of speech, we can make sure this attitude doesn't define our society in the years to come. The Act will give students and academics the practical framework to put the exchange of ideas over ideology, discussion over division. And I'll end on the words of the late, great Sir Roger Scruton, another policy exchange author, and one of the lecturers I was lucky enough to have during my own university experience. Free speech is not the cause of the tensions growing around us, but the only possible solution to them. Thank you. I imagine there'll be many uh, questions. Who do I see early thing? Gentleman there in the front with, raise it with, the, with the raised hand and the pencil. We're getting the microphone for you. Just give your name and organisation, please. Thank you very much. I'm Jack from The Sun. Um, Minister, in your, in your speech, uh, you made the point that while freedom of speech should be protected, um, maybe abusive viewpoints uh, shouldn't be tolerated. Um, where do you draw the line at that? And would you be comfortable for someone like Andrew Tate to address a group of students? So what this act is trying to do is protect students' ability to debate controversial and contested opinions. What it doesn't protect is people's ability to spread hate. And what the bill sets out is that universities must take reasonable and practicable steps to make sure that they're upholding their freedom of speech duties. But that has to balance with things like the Equality Act uh, and other <coughs> criminal law uh, and make sure that people aren't inciting hatred. Andrew Tate, would you be happy for him to come speak? So I don't think there's any place for people who are spreading hate on campus. So, so Andrew Tate, no. So I wouldn't like to see Andrew Tate speak on campus. But that being said, when I go and talk to schools, I think them being able to debate the kind of things that Andrew Tate has talked about has been the best way to counter some of those views, because after all, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Someone else there in the front. Gentleman there, yes, the other gentleman on the left side there in the front row. Name an organisation, please. Uh, hi, Kamel Jaffa from the Daily Mail. Uh, on the wider issue of free speech, how concerned are you about banks shutting down uh, individuals' accounts who might express uh, different political views? Well, so I can't talk about the individual case because I don't know the full details, but I think it's completely unacceptable for a bank to shut down an account because they don't like the opinions of the individuals. I know the Chancellor has personally been very exercised by that, and I think the Treasury is also looking into this. Good, man. I see a few other hands somewhere. Lady there in the middle, central aisle, yes. Name an organisation, please. Hi, Poppy Wood from the I. Um, I wonder if you can appreciate that there's any irony in the notion of a free speech czar, um, somebody who you know, can decide what does and what doesn't constitute free speech. I mean, you yourself seem to decide that Andrew Tate wouldn't constitute um, the right to free speech. But you also said that freedom of speech should be a right for all. Um, how do those two tally up? Because, again, what I'm talking about is the freedom for people to talk about contested opinions, which is not the same thing as freedom to spread hate. So even now, if you look at the way our society works, we don't have unlimited free speech. We have other duties which prevent, for example, harassment and, and people inciting violence. And I think those things are really important. And that's exactly the balance that we're trying to get right. So, yes, you will have to uphold people's right uh, for freedom of speech, but you have to balance that with your other duties in terms of things like the Equality Act. Just looking online, I see one or two questions there. Louisa Clarence Smith, name and uh, well, you've got we've got your name. Organisation, please. Hi, can can you hear me? Telegraph. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Right. Um, I just wanted to ask Claire um, 
The Office for Students has now been investigating Sussex University over its treatment of Kathleen Stock for more than 18 months. Is that good enough or do we need to see a tough, tougher regulation of free speech? Well, I mean, that's exactly why we have this Act. The whole point of what we're trying to do is make sure that people, whether they're visiting speakers or academics or students, have a free means of redress through the <coughs> Office for Students' new complaint system. Uh, and as a, a result, once that's been exhausted, we'll be able to go to court to seek redress. And I think it's really important those processes are timely and efficient. I see lots of... Yes, there's somebody in the middle there, a, a very long hand there, gentleman there, name and organisation. Uh, my name is Charles Pender. Uh, I, 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 my capacity here, I think, would be as a very recent and very mature graduate student at Oxford University. Um, and uh, I was very pleased at the outcome and the intervention of the university on the recent Oxford Union matter, although I'm not a mem was a member of the Oxford Union. But what I wanted to ask, comparing today with when I was a, an undergraduate over 40 years ago, one big difference, um, I mean, uh, not, you know, notwithstanding the importance of free speech, and, and I fully support your act, um, is, is the diversity of opinions with which people arrive, I think. Because in, in, the, in the late 1970s, um, you know, there was actually a division of broad political opinion, which certainly at, at the university I was at, uh, Cambridge, which was not sort of totally uh, out, of, out of step with the country as a whole or the older generation. And I wonder whether part of the issue is, yes, free speech, absolutely, but if, you, if um, the young people are so... Uh, for whatever reason, so, uh, for want of a better shorthand, left biased, if you're the minority which isn't that, um, then it can make, just on peer group pressure and wanting to be uh, liked and not sort of stand out as a, a, as a weird eccentric, it, it must be quite difficult for um, uh, undergraduates today. I wonder if you've got any comments on that and how, uh, in a broader sense and pure free speech, universities can help to um, promote um, uh, respect for diversity and indeed actually possibly even getting um, people of more diverse opinions arriving at universities in the first place? Well, I, I think what we're trying to do here is make sure that universities have a right to, pro to have a duty, sorry, to promote free speech. And that means viewpoints of all kinds. Um, I don't think they have a duty to tell students what to think. It's just, it's more that they need to tell them that they should be able to critically think uh, and make sure that they're not sort of biasing their views. I think that's the really important thing. Uh, and overall, the best way that you can do that is by exposing people to different kinds of opinions and then let them make up their minds for themselves. Thank you. I see a lot of other gentlemen there on the far side of the room, second row. Right. Yeah, if you just wait till the microphone comes. Thanks. Name an organisation, please. Uh, <clears throat> Lord Palmer, House of Lords. Uh, uh, thank you for your speech, and I think we fully support that. It's um, you mentioned social media, and and you mentioned the. Uh, ability of it to create sort of tribes of people and uh, I mean I think to myself with the House of Lords where we're forced to get together and debate in open and we have a sort of rule of courtesy and uh, I would say that probably the House of Lords has one of the highest standards of debate in the country um, whereas you've got now through social media uh, elements which are encouraging tribes in color, encouraging uh, isolation from the other side. And, uh, you know, this hatred developing. I woke up the other morning thinking the world is full of hatred. It, we used to talk about love and kindness more than we do today. So um, I, I'm just wondering how we can sort of stop this McCarthyism uh, developing, uh, where particularly, uh, as, as you say, the most active sort of... Uh, push out everybody else and, if necessary, criminalise them. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's encouraged by social media, but if everyone's going to be in their rooms and be part of a group, how, how are you going to stop that? How, how are you going to get them joining up with the other side? 
Well, I mean, this is something that I worry about. Um, and I think the best antidote to people feeling that people who have different views or different experiences to them are the other is often people spending time to, uh, together because that's when you get that human connection. Uh, you can find that common ground. You can, you can see that there are some shared experiences. And I think every time we've seen that happen, we've seen tolerance uh, increase. So I do think it is about making sure that we can talk freely to each other, that we can have that space to connect on a very human level, even where we have different opinions. And that's partly what this bill is trying to do in a, in a small way, to try allow for that space within our culture for people to be able to do that. I see a lot of other questions also. On the lady there next, if you just uh, wait for the mic, name an organization, please. Samantha Cowan, I work with Lord Farmer. Um, so thinking upstream, how can we ensure that school children are able to, to question, albeit respectfully, things like transgenderism in their peers? Well, I mean, this is a, a very live discussion we're having at the moment because, as you may know, the Department of Education is drawing up uh, guidance on these kind of issues, uh, which will be due out soon. And I think it's really important that we understand their sensitive matters, we address them compassionately, but we make sure that we are giving clear space for, for students, again, to be able to debate and think freely about contested ideas. I see a few questions online. Harry Anderson, Universities UK. Can you hear me, Harry? Yep, can hear you, hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, it's um, yeah, Harry Anderson from Universities UK, and, and as you uh, might guess in the name, we, we represent uh, about 140 different universities. Just uh, thinking about the, the Office for Students and the role of Arif Ahmed as the Director for Free Speech, what role do you see him playing, Minister? Is it more the role of a kind of a guide dog in supporting institutions with some of those difficult and sensitive balancing acts when it comes to you know, other duties that apply to universities? Or is it a watchdog role where they will need to be sort of, you know, inspecting institutions and making sure that they're not sort of falling foul of the new duties? Thanks. So it will be a little bit of both. The work that's happening now, he'll be officially appointed in August, but the work that will happen after that is that he'll work at the OFS to draw up guidance and set up the complaints process. So he absolutely will be there, and I know he's very keen to engage uh, with universities about what the new policies will mean and make sure that they feel well equipped uh, to take them on. But then he also will have powers to investigate where he thinks people have crossed the line, uh, and so he'll be able to do both. I see a question from Fred Bromley of Hanover Communications. Fred, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, I was just wondering if you recognise concerns that some of the protections for free speech being progressed by this bill are being undermined elsewhere by things like measures in the online safety bill that will undermine encryption and introduce mass surveillance. And you might have seen the comments from the president of the non-profit messaging app Signal this week on that subject. And whether you also understand um, the worries that these kind of provisions will set a precedent for authoritarian regimes um, that are just waiting for a liberal democracy like the UK to introduce rules like this, um, but will then use them themselves for their own purposes and without the same checks and balances that we enjoy. So if you think about what those two bills are trying to do, they're very, very different things. So the online safety bill is trying to make sure that children can't access pornography and other things like that. What the freedom of speech bill is trying to do is trying to make sure that university students have the ability and space to develop their critical thinking. So I do think those two things can coexist. I see a lot of uh, questions. Um, gentlemen, front row, please. Name an organisation, please. Thank you. Uh, Aubrey Alvarezzi from The Guardian. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'm, I'm curious to what extent the issues you've touched upon today also exist in politics. Uh, we sometimes hear complaints from ministers about the Whitehall blob or the belief that the civil service is gripped by a particular political bias. Do you think there is a lack of freedom of debate in Whitehall or that those who are formulating policy and advice self-censor in the way that you said some academics do? I mean, well, I happily have a lot of debate in Whitehall, so that's not been an issue that I personally had. Um, look, I think overall, what's really important is that people who are making decisions are allowed to debate freely. That's something that we do do in Parliament, and it's really important that it's protected. Uh, that's something you will see in the House of Commons a lot. And I personally, when I've worked for the civil service, have felt perfectly free to express my views, even where we've disagreed. Uh, and usually I find them very helpful and responsive. 
thank you. Um, lady there in the middle, yeah. about halfway down, yeah. Name and organisation, please. Um, hi, I'm Joanne Nadler. I'm a freelance uh, writer and commentator. Um, a lot of your um, comments have been made in the context of the Equalities Act, and I'm wondering whether you have any concern at all about a future administration, perhaps strengthening the terms of the Equality Act, um, bringing in more protected characteristics, and whether there's any kind of threat to free speech from the public sector equality duty, does that need looking at? I mean, I think that's a, a, a very interesting question. At the moment, uh, I think they can work perfectly in tandem. I would have to see what other changes people would make to see uh, if that would be a concern. But I think it is very important that we get the balance right, that we are protecting people with minority characteristics. But at the same time, we're not preventing people in the majority from expressing opinions. Um, and I think those two things need to coexist for social cohesion. And at the moment, I think we can get that balance right. That's why we've put forward uh, the bill is to make sure that we can balance uh, different duties from making sure that people are protected, but also making sure that people can speak freely. And I think it is perfectly possible to do that, but I'd have to look to see uh, what changes would be made to, to see if that was concerning. Gentleman in the second row, Bev. Um, Lord the Sanders, King's Council, Member of the House of Lords. Um, my starting point is, is that anything in, that in this country, you can do anything or say anything unless it's contrary to law. In other words, you mustn't breach the criminal law and you mustn't do something which you can be sued for, legally. Um, what qualifications would you put on that? And how do we actually get it across to children and students? I mean, I, see, I think that that is accurate. We do have different elements of law which protect, um, like I said, we talked about the equality duty inciting uh, hatred and violence, um, we've got aspects of criminal law and then we've got the, the prevent duty. So there are a few duties which cover uh, this area um, and uh, outside of that you are allowed to, to say what you want. I think if you think about somewhere like a university campus, um, it may be that people want to, to think about those things quite carefully and see that how that will affect students. Um, but outside of that, we should try and have uh, as much debate as possible. Like I said, what this is about is making sure uh, not uh, that students just th making sure that they don't just hear views of people who agree with them, that they can test their thinking on people who disagree with them, because actually that often sharpens our own ideas uh, and makes our own uh, opinions clearer. So I want them to be able to have that opportunity, and I think that's what this bill will do. I'm just seeing gentlemen there towards the, on the fire, near the wall. Name an organisation, please. Uh, Sam Armstrong from the Free Speech Union. I mean, so I think this bill does much to do with the problem at universities, but perhaps the cases of Batley Grammar School and others show that there's also a problem at schools. Free speech is currently not listed as a fundamental British value by the department. Would it consider adding it to it to deal with the problem at schools? Um, that's a, an interesting question. I think at the moment what we've got in schools is very clear guidance that teachers shouldn't be teaching contested opinion as fact. Um, I know we've had lots of uh, conversations about uh, things that have happened recently, and we are setting out specific guidance on some of those areas. For example, I talked about the, the transgender guidance that is coming out imminently uh, to, to help schools navigate some of these sensitive issues. I haven't particularly looked at that. I'd be happy to, to take that away. Um, at the moment, I am focused on students in higher education and making sure that they are getting the access that we want to all of these brilliant debates. Thank you. Who else do I see? Lady there on the far side near the door. I see a hand. Uh, can you wait till the microphone comes? Na yeah. Name an organisation, please. Um, hello. Um, my, my name's Jones and I'm an ex-academic and the question I want to um, ask the Minister is I, I approve of everything that has been uh, you um, put in the train but do you think the vice chancellors are going to be more frightened of the free speech czar than they are of the students how effective is this going to be and also what confidence can academics have because if they're subject to this sort, this sort of thing the main thing they want to do after a while is get out, get out of this unpe unpleasant and lo lo situation. So that what worries me is the lack of rapid and effective discipline f uh, against those who have disrupted lives uh, by denying free speech. 
So I've already had conversations with vice chancellors and others in leadership positions and actually the response has been positive. Uh, they do want to uphold free speech. I think they have had quite a, a challenging time and the ones that I've been speaking to have been looking at how they can draw up um, uh, policies to, to talk to students about free speech and the importance of free speech when they start at university and how they can get a balance right in terms of uh, upholding all of their different duties and actually they have um, I think reacted uh, positively and openly to what we're trying to do. Uh, I think in making sure that academics feel supported, that is part of the, the driving thrust of what we were trying to do in this bill. And I have spoken to far too many academics who feel um, you know, very concerned about creating new courses, running their courses, and I think it's really important that we make sure that they can find their job rewarding, that they don't feel at fear uh, uh, you know, full of fear at work for the risk of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing and that their ability to give the best of their teaching abilities to their students is protected and that is exactly what we're trying to do and I've had very encouraging conversations with academics throughout the course of the bill who I hope will feel supported by what we're doing. Good, I see if it, yes, towards the back there on the, that near the wall, gentleman there, name an organisation please. My name's Guy Davy Jury. I'm from the Union of Jewish Students. Um, so far, throughout the passage of this bill, we've seen some contradictory messages um, about Holocaust deniers coming to speak on campus. Will Holocaust deniers be able to use the provisions of this act um, uh, to be allowed to speak on campus and to make a claim that they're no platforms on campus? So I, we were clear throughout the, the passage of the act, and I'll be clear now, there is no place for Holocaust denial on campus. Um, what we're trying to do, as I said before, is make sure that we're protecting people's ability to debate contested opinion, but not to spread hate, and that, that would absolutely count as spreading hate. Other questions? I see you seem to have quite a lot of hands up. Who do I see? That was Ian Mansfield, I think. Um, as Arif Ahmed gets set into his new role, um, what do you hope you'll see in his first 12 months? What would you like to see in terms of substantive changes within our universities? Well, I think the first major thing that he's going to do is obviously set up the complaint system and set out guidance for universities to help them navigate the new policies. But I know that he's very keen to engage with universities. When I talk about that wider cultural change, it won't come just from guidance or, or having uh, a new statutory tool. I think it will come from engagement, making sure that he can help people, particularly with some of those aspects around promoting free speech. He talks very persuasively about it himself. He's himself had the experience of defending free speech throughout his life. And I think going to, to help other people do that uh, where they need support is also a really important part of his role that I know he's very keen to do. Thank you. I see a question online. Ian Shelley, Sloan Estates. Can you hear me? Silence. Can you hear me? Once. I, I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Your question, yes. please. Yes. I wanted to follow up on the earlier question of, of schools. I was, I was glad to hear you identify progressivism as, as the force we're up against. Um, now, progressivism is not just a political position. It's, it's a religion, and it's the iteration of socialism for our generation. Socialism through language rather than guns. Um, and we need to have the courage to engage the debate at that deep religious level. Um, Christianity was a very light touch religion. This is much more totalitarian. And what's what I'm point, thinking is that should we not... Here? What's your question here? Yeah, what's your question, please? Should we not, in schools, be teaching children that progressivism is a belief system alongside Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, that one can learn about and that one can decide to follow or you can decide not to follow. There's no religion that is above all others. Um, that's an interesting question. We have, we have space within the curriculum for people to talk to students about these matters, but I think the really important thing is that we focus on a knowledge-rich curriculum which is preparing them for their later stages of life. And actually what you will have seen from our education policy over the last uh, 
13 years is a massive improvement in standards for students, uh, a huge rising in terms of international rankings. Uh, and I think that work that we've put in to make sure that they get that high quality, edu high quality education uh, has really, really paid off. And I pay tribute to, to Michael Gove, formerly of this parish, um, and Nick Gibb and others who've done a huge amount of work to get us there. Anybody else? In the middle, yes. Central Isle. Name an organization, please. Felice, uh, Ideas Matter. Um, some would argue that someone like Kathleen Stock does spread hate um, in a way that should be unacceptable under the Equality Act. And I wonder if you would tell us how you'd determine the difference between um, d hate and opinion um, j without just resorting to opinions that you or Arafat might find reasonable. So I think the debate uh, in the area of uh, trans women, for example, which I think you're, you're talking about in terms of Kathleen Stock, is about where should rights exist and how should that work in terms of rights balancing two groups together. That is at the matter, that is at the moment a matter of opinion, which I think is right for society to be able to debate in whatever forum. I think if people were, um, you know, spreading hate and, and, and smearing a group of people, that's a very different uh, level of debate. And that's where I think you can draw a line. It will be for universities to decide, uh, but I think they will be able to do that and make sure that they can balance both of those two duties. Good. Uh, did I see any more questions? Sorry, my gentleman there. Yes, on the far side there. If you just wait till the microphone. Name an organization, please. Um, James Vitale, Policy Exchange. Um, slight declaration of interest as a former president of the Cambridge Union. Um, I wondered if you have come across, maybe with Arif, any examples of institutions or organisations that are upholding free speech and promoting free speech well um, across the country? Uh, yes, I mean, there have been a few. I think the one that I mentioned where I thought they got a, a really good balance recently was the Vice-Chancellor at, at Oxford University who had a... a um, Kathleen Stock to speak and she made sure that not only could uh, Kathleen speak but also that students outside were able to, to protest as well so that all parts of the debate could be heard and she did so with a concern I think for welfare of students as well so I thought she had in that instance got the balance um, and right she came out and, and spoke about it in a way that was both compassionate but also clear that we must be able to hear different sides of debates and I thought that was well handled. Do I see any more questions anyone? I said there seemed to be somebody in a sort of small finger going up somewhere that I couldn't tell. Uh, well, if I'm allowed a second one, uh, on the yeah. follow-up. Last question. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on the school's point of a uh, friend down here. I mean, my son happens to be a school teacher who, um, while learning has particularly extreme views, is uncomfortable with some aspects of what he's expected to conform in a state school to, to about the trans issue. Uh, and in particular, he was very concerned that he was being told that he should um, uh, uh, rec uh, recognize social transitioning of girls in his class without the parents having been told and also without any medical issue. And um, I mean, he's quite outspoken and he's you know, involved in policy as a local councillor, so he's sort of. But, but, but he, even he found it quite uncomfortable uh, actually. Uh, making clear that he didn't quite agree with the way the school, the con which was the consensus of, 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 of the teachers and the head. And what's, the your, what's your question? So my question is that I, I agree with this. I think there is an issue in schools uh, at, um, at which needs to be addressed in terms of actually minority views amongst teachers and indeed school pupils feeling free to, uh, to express their views. Um, and, and I, 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 I whereas well, what's, your question, what's your my question? My question is, please can, you do, please can you urge your colleagues to extend this principle uh, in, in, into, into schools to protect dissident teachers? Um, so I'll say I think this area has been challenging for schools. Uh, we are, as a department, setting out guidance on this area, which will be coming shortly before the end of the summer term. And the Secretary of State, just to your point, I think has been very clear that parents are very central uh, to, to all of this to make sure that they are able to, to protect and safeguard their children in the ways that they should be able to do so. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for coming back here. It's wonderful to have you all here. I'm sure it would not be the last word on uh, this subject and the range of views here today indicates uh, 
all the more why uh, free speech is important. So please just join me in thanking our guest of honour today. <laughs>